Swami Ranganathanandaji, the most authentic speaker of modern times, was indeed the cultural and spiritual ambassador of India. Swamiji has undertaken an extensive tour of 50 countries starting from 1946 to 1972 and 1973 to 1986, during which he visited Australia, USA, Holland and Germany annually. Whosoever once heard Swamiji were captured by the charm, power and beauty of his speech. Although he traveled all over the world, Swamiji remained a sannyasin in the true essence of it, as he lived up to the two basic vows of a monk, chastity and poverty. His lectures and writings have aroused great interest amongst largest numbers of Westerners in our Vedantic universal philosophy and our ancient scriptures. Here are selected rare video lectures delivered by Swamiji. Swamiji addressing students at Daikin University, Australia. The year was being celebrated as the year of international peace and the subject was does religion play a role in bringing in international peace? In his lectures to foreign delegates, religion was better called as philosophy of life. Swamiji always spoke of religion as a scientific quest for truth. Maharaj would say that the same spirit of scientific temper and inquiry that we employ to investigate the mysteries of material world if directed inward, it becomes religion or spirituality. He would say emphatically that religion is a science. It's not a dogma or creed or a superstition. It is the purest of sciences. Maharaj strove hard to make people understand the difference between ethnic religion and scientific religion. For him, Religion is the science of human possibilities. It is the science of spiritual growth and fulfillment. Have religions any role in the field of international peace? When you look at it straight, you feel great doubt because religions themselves have been utterly peaceless we should understand religion as a science of man's spiritual growth. Then a new picture will emerge. My proposition that religion has two dimensions. One is called the ethnical dimension. The other is the spiritual dimension. The ethnical dimension is the dimension in which you and I were born. You were born a Catholic. You didn't choose it. You were born a Hindu or a Muslim. You didn't choose it. That I call the ethnical dimension. And today when we use the word religion, we understand only the ethnical dimension. So we say Hindu, Muslim, Christian, all are fighting with each other, we say. But suppose we understand religion in a scientific sense. What is the nature of a scientific dimension of religion? When you seek religion, then you become scientific in that particular field. For seeking is the most important part of science. If you seek truth, then you will get science. That science can be either science or religion. The word science there means physical science. Science itself is not physical. But you just restrict science to the physical world. World of sensory data. You develop all the modern sciences through that only. But the science itself is not restricted by any data. And India did it ages ago that there are a large area of data beyond the sensory level which need investigation. That is the science of religion. At the sensory level, we have the physical sciences. Above the sensory level, we have no science, but we develop religion as the science of the study of the data 
lying above the sensory level. These are the two levels of experience. In Vedanta and Buddhism, we call it Loka and Lokottara. These are technical terms used there. In that science, they discovered something profound within man above the sensory level. What the instrument? The mind itself. The mind tied to the sensory system and studying the sensory world gives you physical sciences. The mind detached from the sensory system and then trying to understand what is at the back of this consciousness of man. That is the science which developed into the science of religion. We call it Adhyatma Vidya. Then Adhyatma means spiritual. Spiritual, science of spirituality. This is moving, it's quite all right, I think. Nothing wrong. It moves with me. <laughs> <laughs> then our great investigators in this field, the sages of the Upanishads said, at the last stage of your search for truth, you discover a divine dimension in every human being. So the first sentence of that science is, each soul is potentially divine. A newborn baby, you just look into its eyes, what are the possibilities hidden in that baby? I can say a big Einstein is sleeping in him, or a Buddha, or a Jesus. All are their possibilities. We have to bring out these possibilities. And so, Vedanta developed itself as a science of human possibilities. And in that way, by training the mind in concentration, and in penetration into the human personality. Leave behind external factors of personality like the body, nervous system, psychic system, and in the depth they discovered the mortal, the infinite, behind the mortal and the finite. That was a tremendous discovery. Every subsequent age produced great teachers who discovered the same truth that this divine immortal dimension is our true nature, is the nature of all. We are essentially one. One infinite Atman is present in all of us, like a thread that runs through a number of pearls, uniting all the pearls. That is how they presented the idea of God in Vedanta. When you realize that truth, then only love can come from you. Only peace can come from you. Because all these sensory forces which are acting to create evil in society, crime in society, you go beyond all of them. You reach a dimension where you feel your oneness with all and wherever there is a sense of oneness, no hatred can come. The highest fruit of Vedanta or the highest fruit of the science of religion is peace. So the word peace comes again and again in the Upanishad. You recite a mantra, in the end you will find Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Shanti means peace, always. At the end, that is a mantra. So that peace is hidden within us. But at the sensory level, there is no peace at all. All tension. If you can go deeper and touch the divine dimension, a tremendous change takes place in you, in every human being. That is the challenge thrown by Vedanta, that religion as a science is a source of peace. We have a genetic constitution in which you have the sensory system well established here. Now man alone has the capacity to transcend the limitations of this genetic constitution. You know, animal can do it. This is accepted in modern biology as well, that this psyche which is tied down to this organic system, I can detach it from the organic system and expand it 
in love, compassion, sympathy, etc. And this is the line of human evolution, says 20th century biology. So today's biology says evolution in the human stage has become psychosocial evolution. The object of evolution is fulfillment, not organic satisfaction. I am tied to my organic system. Then I am only concerned with myself. I exploit you for myself. As soon as I transcend this limitation of the genetic system on my consciousness, I expand. The word is expansion. Physically we cannot expand. About 200 pounds it is bad to expand, isn't it? <laughs> Intellectual expansion has a limit. Spiritual expansion is unlimited. You can expand and expand, unlimited, because you are truly infinite. The first time a political document contained a spiritual truth. That is the declaration of the preamble of the UNESCO. There this sentence occurs. Since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. Dr. Joshua Oldfield, an intellectual, what he said? More wars are caused by bad-tempered people seeking to discuss peace measures than by good-tempered people seeking to discuss war measures. <laughs> there is such a thing as raising the level of consciousness, number one. Secondly, there's a wonderful idea that's called refining experiences. This body-mind complex can become a beautiful refinery of human experience. More and more people become moral. More and more people become human. That violence, that greed, all that will vanish. That is called spiritual growth. What a beautiful conception. Individuality is a source of tension. And yet, we must develop individuality. You must go one step higher. Grow into the person, personality. That's a wonderful idea. Individuality growing into personality. What is the difference between the two? Individuality is contained within the genetic system. My whole consciousness is contained within my genetic system. I, I, I. The raw I. Such a person or such an individual is always like a billiard ball, says Burton Russell. It is his philosophy. You become a billiard ball. What does a billiard ball do with another billiard ball? They collide. That's all. That's called conflict. Social conflicts arise when men and women develop strong individualities and never proceed further. That is the truth about it. The second step is the most important for man. If he is to be a center of peace and radiate peace, that's called personality. What has happened now? What I said earlier, you are able to overcome the tyranny of this genetic system and expand your consciousness. That is what has happened in personality. I'll give you one definition of personality given by the late Sir Julian Huxley. He is writing a foreword to Chardin's book, Phenomenon of Man. In a footnote he gives there, persons are individuals who transcend. See the every word. Persons are individuals who transcend their near organic individuality in conscious social participation. When you participate in the lives of other organisms around you, you cease to be limited to this genetic system. Something in you has expanded. Body has not expanded. You were 200 pounds before, now also 200. But something else has expanded in you. That is your consciousness. Your sense of I. It has expanded to cover so many others as well. You can dig affections in other people. This is the spiritual growth of man. The first few stages, it can go on indefinitely until you feel your oneness, the whole of creation. 2,300 years ago, there was a great emperor by the name Ashoka, Mauryan emperor, a Buddhist emperor. He proclaimed this message on so many edicts on stones and rocks. Samavaya Eva Sadhu, the famous Sanskrit uh, saying,
Yeah. Samavaya means concord, harmony. Eva means alone. Sadhu is right and good. In religion, harmony, concord, alone is right and good. Not discord. This is a message the emperor spread throughout his territory. That is a vast territory. Even you can see, you see, this is India, you will see going like this. And this area of northwest Afghanistan, part of Soviet Russia, all the Ottomans empire. Capital here, Padaliputra, tremendous empire it was. A Buddhistic empire, absolutely humanistic, plenty of hospitals for animals and edgy wells. The famous British historian says, this is the only man among all the crowned heads whom we can really respect. He renounced war as an instrument of social and political policy after winning a war, seeing the suffering of people. That is a great peace movement he started at that time. Because of him and the earlier sages and Buddha, India became educated in religious toleration, religious respect for every religion. So harmony and peace is natural. First, in the Isha Upanishad, first Upanishad. Yastu Sarvani Bhotani Atman Nevan Upashati Sarva Bhotesh Atman Tatovana Vijugup Sati. If you see the whole world in the one's own Atman and one's own Atman in all the rest of the world, such a person cannot hate anyone. We feel our oneness with all. That's the language used there. No hatred, no violence is possible. So, in two great texts, you find meditation on universal friendliness advocated. One is in Yoga Sutra of Patanjali, a beautiful expression, one sutra. The other is in Buddha's teachings, that when you sit in meditation, send out a current of love and friendliness to the whole world. Is one of the acts of meditation. What's called? Maitri Bhavana, it is called. Maitri. Maitri means friendliness. Maitri. The Mitra. Mitra, you know, Mitra religion was the Roman Empire. Also from the word. Mitra actually means the son and the friend. And Maitri means friendship or friendliness. Bhavana means meditation. Meditation on universal friendliness. Every day, sit and meditate. Let my love go to the whole world, envelop the whole world. What a beautiful idea. If all the 4,000 million people in the world can daily meditate one minute on this, there will be no war at all. But what do we do actually? Vivekananda says, we sent out bombshells of hatred to the world every minute. Naturally, there is violence. There is crime, there is everything. These are the two methods available today. One is modern microbiological method, genetic engineering, etc. The other is science or spirituality. Through this, we can achieve real universal peace with human dignity also in the bargain. That is what I wish to tell you. You can now ask any questions for clarification or amplification or correction. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> An embodiment of purity, strength, and universality, Swamiji remained a humble servant of the Holy Trio. He announced, We do not have a mission, we are but their instruments. Wherever he went, he spread the message of Sri Ramakrishna, Vivekananda, and proved that these messages are purifying, strengthening, and universal. Swamiji once said to Rama Poldaman, a great admirer of India from Holland, that he doesn't speak on yoga as physical exercise in which they were engaged in then but on the spiritual and philosophical dimension of yoga known as Vedanta. To this they replied, this is exactly what we want. The Vedanta movement that began slowly in those centers of the world 
have soon developed into permanent centers today. Here, Swamiji is with a group of devotees at Holland. A new center was being opened there and it was named Ananda Bhavan. Friends, Please. I have lit the lamp just now to inaugurate this center and this whole campus has got a name. Rama has chosen a very beautiful Sanskrit name, Ananda Bhavan, the home of bliss. So I am glad to open this Ananda Bhavan today in the service of the people for health, total health, physical, mental, spiritual. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Om Peace, Peace, Peace. Swamiji's speech had a universal message. He could speak on any topic, but always stressed upon eternal values, which are for all, irrespective of religion or region. Swami Sarvagatanandaji introduces Swamiji to a group of audience with a panel of guests for a question and answer session in Chicago Vedanta Society. There were questions like, how do we identify a real Swami from a fake Swami? Why is there so much suffering in the world? And like, there was one question on, do we need a Guru? Swamiji so beautifully explained everything that the audience asked more questions while they understood with ease. I was wondering, what does it mean to accept someone as a Guru in your tradition? Really speaking, in spiritual life, especially in the spiritual life of Bhakti, and also in Jnana, that is philosophical path, a time comes when you are seeking alone by yourself to you feel the need for guidance. A little help so that your path can be more steady. It is at that time when your heart is feeling that need, then you seek a guru. Then that guru's help is really effective. Mm -hmm. I have seen people telling me, my spiritual life was going on. Just now I had initiation from the guru. My mind has become steady. I feel a wonderful strength coming to me. A Holland lady told me she ran all the way to Calcutta, flying for two days just to get a mantra from President of the Ramakrishna Order and writes to me from Holland, I feel tremendously strong, great stability has come to my life, I feel very happy like that. That's why when you are a seeker of spirituality and the right time the help comes to you, that makes you stronger in your resolve. Swami Ranganathanandaji was a pilgrim of eternal values spreading the life-giving, man-making message of the Holy Trinity in a manner unique and unparalleled in recent times. Purity manifested itself in various forms like compassion, simplicity, humility and openness. His magnetic personality attracted people from different strata of the society, giving them inspiration, joy and encouragement. Wherever he went, the place would become a center of festivity. He once said in one of his lectures on ecstasy in daily life, and he quotes, In those whose heart the infinite Lord hurry, the ocean of auspicious is established. For such people, every day is a festival, and every day is good fortune, and every day is full of welfare. Here, Swami Sarvagatanandaji is introducing Maharajji to the audience at Boston Vedanta Center. In reality, Sri Sarada Devi was Sri Ramakrishna's first disciple. He had taught her everything that he learned from his various gurus. Impressed by her great religious potential, he began to treat her as the universal mother herself. He said, I look upon you as my own mother and as the mother who is in the temple. Her divinity melted as universal motherhood and started to flow down to every nook and corner. 
Here, Swamiji unveils a magnificent portrait of Holy Mother in the dining hall at Ganges Monastery in Chicago in 1987. He offers the prasad at the lotus feet of the Holy Mother with other monks and inmates while chanting the Brahmarpanam mantra and partakes it with the devotees. Swamiji says that the complete works by Swami Vivekananda has helped immensely to shape his life and character in the service of humanity in India and abroad. He himself used to remark, Do you know everybody has two corpuscles, but I have three corpuscles. If you cut my arm, you will find in my blood red, white and Swami Vivekananda corpuscles. Here in his room at monks' quarters, Hyderabad Mutt, Swamiji addresses a group of foreign professors who were invited for a conference by Osmania University, Hyderabad. His eloquent exposition on varied subjects created an enhanced picture of India on the global front. Audience listened to the lecture with the keenest attention. One state will support more than two religions, three religions. Because they are all pathways to one supreme truth. This was not a political expediency. It is born of a vision of unity in diversity. It is born of a real conviction that truth is one. Its ways are many. The path to truth is, are, are many. And now this statement comes from the oldest book of man, the Rig Veda. That is the oldest book of man, say four or five thousand years ago. There it is mentioned here, Egam Sat, Vipra Bahudha Vadanti. Truth is one. But sages call it by various names. Names only are different, not the truth itself. Now that was imprinted upon the Indian mind, first of the thinkers and sages, then on the political state, then on the common man also. That is what made people respect every religion. In the history you will find plenty of instances. Foreign religions come foreign cultural groups come, they are not killed and destroyed. They are welcome, given a place in this great country, and everybody thrives. The first story is the Jews who came here when their temple was killed, was shattered by Roman tyranny in 70 AD. Then there was a dispersion. A group came to India, that is in Kerala. They were received, welcomed, protected, and they had absolutely nothing to complain about their home country compared to all the other countries where Jews went. This is a profound truth about India's relation with the Jews. Then also early Christians, when the Parsis came from Iran in the 8th or 9th century, when their religion was destroyed, the whole country was converted by the Arab armies, and they came, they were treated with the utmost respect. I know all the Parsis are highly respected in India. They are a very small number. You can easily destroy them, but this country will not do. He respects, it respects all these type of people. Now this tradition, you see, when the common man has the tradition, respect, you come in the name of God, we will respect you, we welcome you. In fact, they say the modern approach is only an echo of our own approach 4,000 years ago. From an undifferentiated state, they come to a differentiated state. That's called evolution. That's called creation. But the word creation we never use. We say projection. We don't have creation theory. A God sitting, taking some external material, shaping something, and we call creation. We don't have that theory at all. 
from the one infinite reality, the universe emerged in a particular form, with a particular order, cosmic evolution, organic evolution, human evolution, these are all stages in the nature of evolution. This is taught by the Sankhya and the Vedanta philosophies in India over 4,000 years ago. So expansion, contraction, this language we use, the universe expands from the one and universe contracts back into the one. The one is a reality from which the many come and the many return to the one. There is an order in it. That's what uh, evolution tries to trace. We also accept the same thing, Vikasa and Sankocha, two Sanskrit words. Vikasa is expansion, Sankocha is contraction. The world expands, so for example the sun, at the time of destruction also, sun will expand. According to modern astronomy, it will swallow the planets and it will die away. That's the end of this solar system. So we also say expansion, contraction. And we don't have what you call the supernatural in the whole thinking of India. We have super physical, we have super, na na super normal, no supernatural. Because the concept of nature he is universal. And this you can see all through history. In Buddha's teachings you will find the same thing addressing a group of people called Kalamas. Addressed the Kalamas, that is 6th century BC. They don't accept anything because it is written in a book, because it is your tradition, because somebody said it is so. Try to examine it. Question it. If you find it is true, live it. Help others also to live it. There is a famous address to the Kalamas in Buddha's teaching. To do the same thing in Ramakrishna's life, when Vivekananda questioned him on various matters, he accepted this questioning, encouraged him to question, please test me, and put in Ramakrishna's words, please test me as the money changes test their coins. That's a beautiful expression, which is wisdom. Vedanta means that, the end of knowledge. So, if you don't have the end of knowledge in wisdom, knowledge may become a trouble. Today knowledge is more a troublesome thing than except getting a job and filling the belly. Knowledge has no particular purpose, particularly like Burton Russell in his, uh, uh, what you call, the impact of science on society in that book, he mentioned there, unless men increase in wisdom as much as in knowledge, Increase of knowledge shall be increase of sorrow. That is almost a, par, uh, uh, a sort of a echo from one of the Upanishads. I'm quoting those three lines in the Chandogya Upanishad, very famous. The last conclusion of that training, Ahara Shuddhau Satya Shuddhihi. Whatever you take in from the external world is called Ahara. Aharati means taking in, either as food or as thought ideas, such as, for example, the TV impressions on young minds. You know, we are all suffering in America, and even here, all the wrong impressions of violence and this and that. So, this is called taking in. If you screen what you are taking in, and take only what is healthy, mind becomes pure, mind becomes penetrating. That's the first sentence. Ahara shuddhau sattva shuddhihi. Sattva means mind, buddhi, reason. Sattva Shuddhau Dhruvas When this reason becomes pure and clear, the memory of your own divine nature becomes constant. At present that memory is not there. We don't know what we are. We misbehave in different ways. As we are under hypnotism as it were. Our true nature we don't know. Therefore that memory becomes constant. When this happens, Smritulambhe Sarvagranthi Nam Vipramakshara. Once this memory of your divine nature becomes constant, all the shackles of your life, all the bondages of your heart become broken, you become free, you become free. You can say, I am free, I am free. That is spiritual freedom. In fact, in one verse of the Kathopanishad, there is a small word that became the subject of one of your films in America, the Razor's Edge, that famous film. Now that comes from the Kathopanishad, in the famous Upanishad, it says, this infinite Atman, Esha Sarvesha Bhuteshu, Gurutho Atma, Naprakashate. This infinite Atman, ever free, ever pure, ever illumined, he is always present in all beings, but hidden, not manifest day to day life. He is always hidden like that. Will it always remain hidden? He says, no, 
can be realized. How? By training the mind in realizing subtle, more subtle, still more subtle truths. And the subtlest truth is the Atman. The body, this nervous system, psychic system, these are all gross, subtle, subtle. And the subtlest is the Atman. Unless the mind becomes sufficiently subtle to catch that wonderful wave, you will not be able to realize it. But all can do so, says this verse. Therefore he says, Uthishtata, Jagrata, Pratyavaran, Nibodhata, Arise, addressing the whole of humanity, Arise, Awake, Approaching the enlightened ones, Enlighten yourself, for the first line. And the second line is where this word comes, Churasyadhara, Nishita, Duratyaya. This path is difficult to tread, hard to cross, like walking on the edge of a razor. That is where razor's edge comes there. Churasya dhara, nishita, duratya, durgam padhastat, kavayo vadanti. Sages who have walked over the path tell you that path is very hard. Unless you have tremendous strength of mind and heart, you won't be able to do it. So be alert. Be alert if you want to cross this path. That is the language of the Upanishads. In Buddha's teaching it is just the same. In Karacharya the same. In Vivekananda today the same. The same ancient Vedanta. A monk without frontiers, Swamiji looked upon the whole of humanity as one family. He has amongst his disciples and admirers people from all walks of life. With seriousness combined with childlike naivete, he could speak to the students with the same ease as he spoke with the professors of a university. During a lecture tour in Britain, as the students of classes 8 to 10 listened with perfect attention, the headmaster remarked that they were very difficult to control in their classroom, but they heard the lecture with perfect attention. Here, Swamiji is explaining the significance of karma theory to a group of devotees in Holland with the help of a translator. While the audience showed great urge to know various spiritual and ethical values, Swamiji expounded the subject and showed much more interest in making them understand. It is uh, freiheit. What you have done, you can undo, because you are free. What you have done, you can weer omgedaan maken, omdat you are free. Yeah. So, any other questions? There must be many. <laughs> Please, can you tell more about karma? In all religions that had their birth in India. It is a uh, karma is a heel groot uh, ja, leerstuk wat in alle religies voorkomt die uh, stammen uit India. Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism. All of them accept karma theory. Het Hinduïsme, het Boeddhisme en het Jainisme, alle uh, accepteren de theorie van karma. That means, according to your actions will be your life, your result. Good actions will produce good results, bad actions, bad results. Dat betekent, je leven zal zijn in overeenstemming met je handelingen. Dat wil zeggen, goede handelingen geven goede resultaten, slechte handelingen geven slechte resultaten. And karma means the assertion of human freedom. What you have done, you can undo. You are free to do so. En karma betekent de bevestiging van de menselijke vrijheid. Wat je hebt gedaan, kun je ongedaan maken. Dat is... Secondly, when somebody is in difficulty, I may say it is his karma. Why should I interfere? That's absolutely wrong idea of karma. It is my privilege to help him when he is in difficulty. I am creating good karma for myself and for him. Thus, karma theory makes you humanistic and go to help other people who are in distress. And wanneer iemand in moeilijkheden zeg, uh, komt, dan kun je zeggen het is zijn karma. Maar dat is een absoluut verkeerde interpretatie van karma. Het is jouw 
privilege om die ander te helpen en zo voor jezelf en voor die ander een goed karma te bewerkstelligen. Once you wipe away the idea that it is fate or destiny, then karma theory stands as the most beautiful theory in dealing with human situations. En zodra je het idee van je werkt dat karma noodlot of lot betekent, dan is karma een van de meest mooie uh, theorieën in het menselijk leven. If I do evil, I am responsible for it. If I do good, I am responsible for it. I can change from evil to good. That power is in me. Exercise it, says karma. Um, Karma betekent als ik uh, goede dingen doe, ben ik er verantwoordelijk voor. En ook als ik slechte dingen doe, ben ik daarvoor verantwoordelijk. En ik heb ook de vrijheid in mezelf om, goede, om slechte handelingen om te zetten in goede handelingen. Associated with the karma theory comes the theory of rebirth or reincarnation. En geassocieerd met die karma theorie komt de theorie van de. Uh, Rebirth or reincarnation. That you cannot work out all your karma in one life, then you take other lives in order to work out your karma and become free. Swamiji believed that only that which is done with knowledge, faith and concentration alone becomes more powerful. From the age of 18 to 96, he worked incessantly for the welfare of the world. He was approachable to all. He had friends all over the world. He could transmit this powerful energy to others or help others kindle Atma Shraddha, conviction in others. Here Swamiji is seen speaking to an audience comprising mostly doctors at a program organized by Vivekananda Swastha Seva Sangha in Kolkata. Today we have had this very instructive, exciting also sometimes, discussion on this great subject, Vivekananda Swastha Seva Sangha. Name itself is so beautiful. Seva Sangha, service society inspired by Swami Vivekananda. For the doctors, you saw Shami Sen and others also referred to that this spirit of seva attitude is needed for all people, not merely for doctors. You saw Ramurthy Teddy, a doctor in the village, can give medicine and treat, cure it. What about environmental hygiene? There must be a government agency doing that work, but he doesn't do his work. He has no spirit of service. That's why today, what Prime Minister said a few days ago, which we knew all the time, if five rupees is spent on a paper, only one rupee will reach the paper. The rest go away somewhere. Because there is no spirit of service. Take for granted that all corruption comes from want of love for man and the spirit of service of man. As soon as that spirit will come, corruption will automatically go. I have no care for others. I care only for myself. That the attitude throughout the nation, in every department just now, we all know it. Everybody talks about it. Here is a message from Swamiji. Those who read his literature, they get a new attitude, a new inspiration. What a joy to work for others. What a joy to live and serve people. Some of the words of Swamiji will come like bombshells into our people today. In fact, in one lecture I said, every student in every school must be given three sentences from Swamiji to discuss among themselves along with the teacher. That will inspire them for a better life. One such saying is what Swamiji wrote in the course of a letter from America to the Maharaja of Mysore. He said, they alone live who live for others. The rest are more dead than alive. Let this sentence be taught to the children, made them discuss this subject, and I put it this way, we had more living people 
when we were under the British, fighting for freedom, then now when we are free, more selfish, living for oneself, don't care for others, unconcerned, you get plenty today. Whereas when we were slaves of the British, we had better mental mind, better attitude, better to sacrifice, service, giving up everything for the sake of the freedom of the nation. So long as the millions live in hunger and ignorance, I hold every man a traitor who, having been educated at their expense, pays no heed to them. What a wonderful sentence. We are committing treason every day. Political treason is a rare thing. Occasionally only take place. But this treason is a continuous treason in our country. A lack of appeals to educate a medical student or an engineering student or an average graduate for 40, 50,000. The state has to spend on you. Your fees cannot bear that kind of uh, whole training. And yet, having got all this education, we forget the nation. We don't care for it at all. We fatten ourselves. What can be a greater treason than this? Says Swamiji, nearly 80 years ago, after freedom, we were turning out so many traitors to the nation from this point of view. That will change when they read Swamiji's literature, get that inspiration. Every word is full of power. Ramadavas, Ramak is simply marvelous. He said, Vivekananda's words are great music. They are like Beethoven symphonies. They are the stirring rhythms of the march of hand and choruses. I cannot touch these utterances of Vivekananda, separated from me in books of 30 years distance, without getting a thrill to my body as an electric shock. That is the shock that the nation needs today. Shock out of complacency. Unconcerned, that shock the nation will get only from this one great literature, Vivekananda literature. Young people, when they are young, quite young, they must start reading this kind of book. Then you will find these problems will become less and less and less because men have become better and better and better. Whenever he left any place, the only parting message he got was. Please come again. Please come again. That was blessing coming for a representative of Amar Bharat, eternal India. A Kolkata women's group once organized a dialogue between His Holiness Dalai Lama and revered Maharajji in Delhi, facilitated by Rajiv Mehrotra. The Tibetan spiritual leader was so impressed by Swamiji that he requested Maharajji to be one of the patrons of the Peace Foundation he founded after receiving a Nobel Prize. ...by the lady study group, and the lady who prefers to remain anonymous, I guess, it's because her husband is here. And, uh, the question is, the Buddha left his heart and home to find enlightenment. Had Yashoda done the same, she would have been regarded as grossly failing in the duty to the family. <laughs> Even the search for freedom through the spirit of power seems to be denied to women. What do your holinesses say in that? <laughs> devoted to Yashodhara and a newborn baby. But a bigger call took him from the palace to the forest. He became a blessing to humanity at large. And Yashodhara also took to spiritual life later on, after Buddha had attained that enlightenment. It was a law which expanded from one individual to the whole universe. That was Buddha's love and experience of spirituality and it is possible for women also to achieve spirituality. Therefore Buddha's system organized the theories, the nuns of Buddhism. Some of them were highly spiritual and they have left 
their experiences in series of poems and beautiful stanzas. They are called Keri Gatha, the songs of the Keris. From there you can see many women had attained high spiritual development in the wake of Buddha's own spiritual realization and his foster mother, Vajapati, was also allowed to become a nun and thus start that nun movement in Buddhism. So, I think uh, what we want is intelligent, wise men and women. You must know the world around you, you must know your own true nature and thus have a full life. That's a beautiful development coming from a comprehensive spirituality which takes man's work and man's meditation. Both are taken together. That is yoga of the Gita. A comprehensive spirituality. Uh, present thinking in India now at the highest government level. We call it value-oriented education. Nearly reading and writing, studying sciences, history, mathematics, as you go. A human value system must come in the child through education. How can we bring it about? That is the subject of discussion today. How to implement it through institutional uh, patterns? That is also being discussed. It is very difficult to impart quality or moral values through mere education, through instruction. But one method is there. Instill the spirit of service through education. What may into service? That service can bring about value system within the individual, a concern for others. You don't serve somebody without a concern. And a concern for others is a moral value, a spiritual value. Today. So through this attitude, service, service, Swami Vivekananda has given greatest emphasis on this idea of service. Seva, we call it in Sanskrit. Tyaga and Seva are the twin ideals of India. Renunciation and service. Renunciation of this ego, this little genetically conditioned I. Then only I can engage myself in a concern for you. This kind of Tyaga and Seva must be central to every education. Then you will have value-oriented education, a concern for others. We don't have it in our education. Our educated people do not show that concern. Go to our government departments, nobody is concerned about you. They are only concerned about themselves. That's the wrong education. So Vivekananda said, we must have a re-education of the educated people. That is where this wonderful in, in, emphasis on value-oriented education comes. In a Madras lecture in 1897, Swami said, bring light into the world, bring light and more light, bring light to the poor, and bring more light to the rich, for they need it more than the poor. Bring light to the ignorant, and bring more light to the educated, for the vanities of the education of the time are tremendous. That is where the greatest emphasis must come in the, on the spirit of service. What can I do for you? How can I help you? That will be a beautiful, value-oriented education. Swami Ranganathanandaji, though not taking active part in politics, following Swami Vivekananda's policy for the mission, had great interest to see that modern India develops a progressive, humanity-directed democratic state and administration. If there is one word in the English language to express the effect which Swamiji produces upon mankind, it is the word fascination. Many nationals, administrators and government officials were influenced by him. He sends out messages of inspiration to be strong, inspiration to be a servant of God, inspiration to be servant of our country, servant of the poor, and servant of mankind. Swamiji is the first recipient of Indira Gandhi Award for National Integration instituted in the year 1985. His benedictory speech can be remembered in the political arena for generations to come. I know I go around India so often there are numbers of people, numbers of institutions 
who are working for national integration silently. If I accept the award today, I accept it on behalf of all of them. So many. For I do go around India all over and I have seen first class people with no communal feeling, with tremendous love for the nation, working silently for building up this great democracy of ours. This award, I do not know what to do with so much money. I have never earned money, but I do spend a lot of money, crores and crores, for the good of the people. So this money will go to the Ramakrishna Mission's work for the tribals in Bastar district, Madhya Pradesh. National integration has been a subject which we have been discussing and trying to tackle for all these several decades. But it looks as if it is like four feet forward and five feet backward. We have not been able to imagine from here the hunger and thirst in people in all parts of the world even to hear a few words about the great teachings of the sages of this great country. And therefore, when we speak of national integration, when we want to bring secular attitudes to our people in government and public life, we must remember that we have a wisdom to guide us in all these matters. National integration is a great idea. How did I get these ideas? Even from childhood, I never knew what caste was. Though brought up in a highly feudal caste student society, by the age of 10 or 12, I had completely discarded all caste notions. An untouchable father and mother were like father and mother to me. They were treating me as their own child. When I joined the order, left my village, they wept for me. Such was my relation. So also Christian students in the school in which I studied, how happily I mixed with them together. Then later on, long after in Karachi, I had a Pathan servant. I had two Muslim youths as my cook and housekeeper. When I left, they wept there. How nice it is to love people and to be loved by people of all communities. That is the spirit that has to inspire us today. Educated in that Vivekananda literature, a literature of strength. In fact, a few weeks ago, a friend was taking me through the famous Bharavi slum in Bombay. I was passing through. Then the thought came to me, why this slum has been here for so many years, spoiling the beauty of Bombay. Bombay is the center of wealth. The whole of India as well goes there. If only a few industrialists joined together, inspired by Vivekananda's vision, why depend always on the state? They can raise a hundred crore in no time, convert it into a heaven tomorrow. It what a tremendous repercussion it will have on other parts of India. If this kind of people's initiative, coming with a tremendous love and concern for man, that education we have not achieved yet. In fact, in my lecture I have written, this lecture has been circulated. Sri Nasimara told me to all the audience, I only speak separately now. He says there, our educated people need a re-education. He said it long ago, in 1897. Bring, I'm quoting his words, on the future of India. Bring light to the world, bring light and more light. Bring light to the poor, and bring more light to the rich, for they need it more than the poor. Bring light to the ignorant, and bring more light to the educated, for the vanities of the education of our time are tremendous. See the language, how contemporary it looks today. And one sentence, which he has written in this letter, must be burned in the soul of the nation today. In all our education institutions, these few sentences must be made to study, discuss, so that people will think of the nation Think of the people, not only one's own profit and pleasure. That letter was written to the then Maharaja of Mysore by Swamiji, 1894. He says, this life is short, the vanities of the world are transient, but they alone live, who live for others, the rest are more dead than alive. Swamiji often used to quote, that a great creative leader like Mahatma Gandhi felt during his visit to Belur Mutt that after studying Vivekananda, my love for India has become manifold. 
He wondered why, after getting independence, our educated, engaged in our politics and administration forgot the common people of India and became self-centered, consumerists and extremely corrupt. The Gandhi Peace Award was originally meant in the honor of Swami Ranganathanandaji. In fact, Swamiji, in his uniqueness, refused to accept it and wanted the Ramakrishna Order to be honored for its services and not himself. Swamiji believed that to be known as a monk of the Ramakrishna Order is his greatest identity. The Gandhi Peace Prize 1998 was awarded to Ramakrishna Mission. Centenary Celebrations of Swami Vivekananda's Visit to Chicago Best known as Swami Vivekananda in the modern age, Swami Ranganathanandaji spread the eternal message of Vedanta beyond the Indian shores. A dynamic personality with a missionary zeal, Swamiji indeed is the best interpreter of Swami Vivekananda's teachings. Here, Swamiji is seen distinctly on the stage, in front of an audience of a few thousands. Not to devoid us of the vision that Swami Vivekananda set a hundred years ago, as on this occasion of centenary celebrations of Swami Vivekananda proclaiming at the World Parliament of Religions. All over the world, lot of disharmony, particularly in the world of religion, in the world of politics, some harmony is coming. But in the world of religion, disharmony is increasing. It is a tragedy. Religion is a source of harmony, but it has become otherwise. It is good for us to know that this great country with its long history has contributed something unique to world thought. Here are a few selected reminiscences from few such admirers who were inspired by Swami Ranganathanandaji's message for national integration. Swamiji felt that we have achieved freedom after a long struggle and established a democratic state and by making it more and more democratic and eliminating its well-established feudal elements only can we elevate our common people. At the memorial meeting held in Delhi on 15th May 2005 after Maharajji's Mahasamadhi, General Secretary of the Ramakrishna Order Swami Smaranandaji paying his tributes to Maharaj. Sri L.K. Advani, remembering his association with Maharaj in Karachi. Former Prime Minister Sri I.K. Gujral, reminiscing about his association with Maharajji. Prime Minister Sri Manmohan Singh, paying his tributes. All of them said that the world has become poorer with the passing away of Swami Ranganathanandaji. And we have gathered together here to pay our respectful homage to Srimad Swami Ranganathanandaji Maharaj, the 13th President of the Ramakrishna Order. Swami Ranganathanandaji was for nine years in Delhi as the head of this center and many of the developments which we see around have all come up during his time. And it is therefore appropriate that this memorial meeting is being held today here at the Ramakrishna Mission premises. Swami Ranganathanandaji was very much well known for his scholarship and oratory. But he had another dimension to his personality. That is his heart. In India we have great ideals, but when it comes to practicing them, we are found wanting. Here is where Swami Ranganathanandaji excels. He cared for everybody, whatever one's status in society may be.
प्रधानमंत्री जी यहाँ आए और गुजराल जी और मैं वहाँ कक्ष में बैठे थे तब मैंने प्रधानमंत्री जी को कहा कि हम दोनों को यह सौभाग्य प्राप्त है कि हमारा स्वामी रंगनाथन जी से परिचय और संपर्क कराची से लेकर के हैं हम दोनों कराची में रहते थे और मैं विद्यार्थी था कॉलेज में स्वामी जी के गीता प्रवचन सुनने जाता था कि वे एक महान चिंतक थे वे एक महान दार्शनिक थे एक महान संत और साधु तो थे ही सन्यासी थे एक प्रकार से जब मैंने अभी इन दिनों में पढ़ा कि उनका जन्म 1908 में त्रिकूर में हुआ केरल में तो मुझे स्मरण आया कि कालड़ी भी कहीं पास है जहां आदि शंकर का जन्म हुआ इसीलिए मुझे लगा कि जिस प्रकार से वो उस काल में इतने शताब्दियां पहले एक महान सन्यासी लेकिन साथ साथ एक महान विद्वान जो गीता हो चाहे उपनिषद हो चाहे पुराण हो चाहे और कोई ग्रंथ हो पौराणिक ग्रंथ हो उसमें कठिन से कठिन विषय उसकी भी व्याख्या इतने सरल सहज शब्दों से भी करते थे एक प्रकार से कह सकते हैं के स्वामी रंगनाथानंदा आज के हमारे आदि शंकराचार्य इस युग के श्री आई के गुजराल द फॉर्मर प्राइम मिनिस्टर ऑफ इंडिया सेड ही हैड ग्रेट फॉर्च्यून ऑफ लिसनिंग टू स्वामी जीस डिस्कोर्सेस इन कराची इन दोस डेज कराची वाज अ वेरी सेंसिटिव प्लेस ऑफ कम्युनल फीलिंग्स पार्टीशन प्रॉब्लम्स एटसेट्रा बट इवन ड्यूरिंग दोस डेज He has won the hearts of the people of all communities. His lectures were above the caste and religion. When I was ambassador to Russia, I was in Moscow. On invitation, Swami ji visited Moscow to deliver a lecture in Moscow University. The vice chancellor was in dilemma. What this monk will speak to the student who cannot understand English and they are all communists? When I told this problem to Swami ji about what he will speak then how you will convey his message Swami ji said no problem get me a translator I will explain everything about the subject let the translator understand thoroughly and convey the same A truly learned and wise man one who attained the ultimate in the knowledge of the self a realized soul a being who radiated bliss such was swami ranganath anand he was without doubt one of the most poetic and philosophical interpreters of the gita in living memory He was regarded by the disciples of Ramakrishna Mission as the second Swami Vivekananda, and rightly so. His interpretation of our ancient and religious texts was laced with modernism, humanism, and liberalism. The values that Swami Vivekananda held so dear in his teachings of Hinduism. from his handsome personality his humane visage in addition to his deep scholarship attracted large audiences he was one of the greatest communicators of our time and a personification of divinity himself